with the U.S. President Joe Biden. Well, good evening. We just concluded this year's NATO summit, and the consensus among the members was it was a great success. It's especially momentous because it represented the 75th year, the most important military defense and alliance in the world's history of the world. We should never forget that NATO grew out of the wreckage of World War II, the most destructive war in history. The idea was to create an alliance of free and democratic nations that would commit themselves to a compact of collective defense. Standing together, they knew we'd all be safer. An attack on one would be treated as an attack on all. And it's worked because a would-be aggressor knows if they attack one of us, they'll be attacked by all of us. Sending that message is the best way to deter aggression and prevent wars in the first place. For those who thought NATO's time had passed, they got a rude awakening when Putin invaded Ukraine. Some of the oldest and deepest fears in Europe roared back to life, because once again, a murderous madman was on the march. But this time, no one cowered in appeasement, especially the United States. We collected intelligence that Russia was planning to invade Ukraine months before the invasion. I, did, I directed the intelligence community to be a significant amount of intelligence to be declassified so I could start building an international coalition to oppose the invasion. Then in February, some of you remember, I warned the world that the invasion was imminent. I rallied a coalition of 50 nations from Europe to Asia to help Ukraine defend itself. My foreign policy, many foreign policy experts thought as Putin amassed Russian forces just 100 miles north of Kyiv, the capital of Ukraine, but he thought, he, Putin thought it was the mother home of Russia. The capital would fall in less than a week. But backed by a coalition to help build, stop them. Today, the Ukrainian people, backed by a coalition to help build, stop them. Today, Kyiv still stands, and NATO stands, stronger than it has ever been. <clears throat> During the week of this summit, several heads of states made it a point in their statements to thank the United States and to thank me personally for all that NATO has achieved. NATO is not only stronger, NATO is bigger because we led the charge to bring in Finland and Sweden into the alliance, and it makes a gigantic difference. Excuse me. Meanwhile, my predecessor has made it clear he has no commitment to NATO. He's made it clear that he would feel no obligation to honor Article 5. He's already told Putin, and I quote, do whatever the hell you want. In fact, the day after Putin invaded Ukraine, here's what he said. It was genius. It was wonderful. Some of you forgot that, but that's exactly what he said. But I made it clear, a strong NATO is essential to American security. And I believe the obligation of Article 5 is sacred. And I would remind all Americans, <clears throat> Article 5 is invoked only once in NATO's long history. And that was to defend America after 9-11. I made it clear that I will not bow down to Putin. I will not walk away from Ukraine. I will keep NATO strong. That's exactly what we did and exactly what we'll continue to do. Now, the future of American policy is up to the American people. This is much more than a political question. It's more than that. It's a national security issue. Don't reduce this to the usual testament that people talk about, the issues of being a political campaign. It's far too important. It's about the world we live in for decades to come. Every American must ask herself or himself, is the world safer with NATO? Are you safer? Is your family safer? I believe the American people know the answer to all those questions is yes. And I believe the American people understand that America is stronger, stronger because of our alliances. I believe the American consensus from Truman to Reagan, to me, still holds today. 
America cannot retreat from the world. We must lead the world. We are an indispensable nation, as Madeleine Albright wrote. Now, let me turn to three other key issues. Just this morning, we had a great economic report showing inflation is down. Overall, prices fell last month. Core inflation is the lowest it's been in three years. <coughs> prices are falling for cars, appliances, and airfares. Grocery prices have fallen since the start of the year. We're going to keep working to take down corporate greed to bring those prices down further. Meanwhile, Trump's calling for a 10 percent tariff on everything Americans buy, including food from overseas, vegetables, and other necessities. And economists tell us that that would cost the average American working family another $2,500 a year. It's a tax of $2,500 a year. Second, our efforts to secure the border, the southern border, is working. After Trump killed the bipartisan effort to secure the border, Republicans and Democrats had worked on, because he thought it would benefit me and make him a loser, Republicans walked away. So I took executive action last month. As a consequence, working with Mexico, border encounters have gone down over 50 percent. The current level is lower today than when Trump left office. Third, for months, the United States has been working to secure a ceasefire in Gaza, to bring the hostages home, to create a path for peace and stability in the Middle East. Six weeks ago, I laid out a detailed plan in writing. It was endorsed by the U.N. Security Council, the G7. That framework is now agreed on by both Israel and Hamas. So I sent my team to the region to hammer out the details. These are difficult, complex issues. There's still gaps to close. We're making progress. The trend is positive. And I'm determined to get this deal done and bring an end to this war, which should end now. Let me conclude where I began. We're the United States of America. We are the indispensable nation. Our leadership matters. Our partnerships matter. This moment matters. We must rise to meet it.